Cool. Can everybody see this? Productizing ML research. Yes. Yes. Cool. Alrighty. Um, Do you want to drop the Fig Jam link in the chat, or is it kind of are you using it more as a as a presentation, or rather than an interactive canvas? Yeah, just as a presentation piece. But I'm I'm happy to share it afterwards. It's still in the drafts, so I'll have to move it out of drafts if uh, give people access. I think. Um, nice. So. Uh, my name is Killian. Um, basically, I've worked in startups for the last 10 years in various different product roles across product management, product marketing, etc. Um, and currently, I'm uh, the head of product at Paperclip, which is a company, a startup based out of London, whose mission it is to make the world's content viewable in any language. What this means in practice is that we have a kind of multi-stage speech-to-speech -speech translation system which we're using to first apply to dubbing video content. So what we do is take a video in, we run some speech recognition on it, then we run it through some machine translation, and then we run it through uh, text-to-speech and we kind of overlay that back on the original video. And what you essentially get is basically you're able to generate a video into any other language that you want. Um, we work with like big media companies, we work with uh, kind of you know, streaming companies, all this type of stuff. Basically anybody who has content in one language and wants to make it accessible to the vast majority of the world who doesn't speak whatever the source language is. Um, I'm going to talk today about productizing ML research. Uh, productizing is not a word I use very often. I actually had to Google it just to make sure it was a real word, but um, kind of commercializing doesn't sound good or isn't as interesting, but um, kind of touching on basically how you build products which are uniquely enabled by machine learning research. Um, so. The paper group itself was actually founded with the aim to commercialize uh, TTS research, so text-to-speech, the, basically the ability to generate expressive pieces of speech. Um, and about one third of the company are machine learning engineers or researchers. Uh, I'm definitely not an expert on the ethics, politics, or development of machine learning models, so I'm going to speak about this from kind of a product and startup lens. Uh, and I've borrowed heavily from other people, but I've tried to reference them uh, wherever possible, and then put a list of uh, kind of a reading list together at the end, which touches it all. Um, I think uh, I'll just kick it off because uh, yeah, it's no point go, uh, going off track this early. Um, so there's no shortage of kind of product building advice out there or kind of reflections on this type of stuff. Like is uh, far too much of it, um, but most of it doesn't actually hold for machine learning products. So I've been thinking about this for the last couple of years as I've been working on Paperclip, and this kind of summation of some of the key thoughts and key implications for building machine learning products. Um, so what we're going to look at today is like, what do we mean by this? Uh, what have products are now possible? What are some key concepts? What are some implications for a startup or product economics? Um, real reference a few different products as well, which we can use kind of uh, draw lessons from, and then hopefully have plenty of time for Q&A and stuff. Um, I'm more probably, I think we have a pretty diverse group, so I'm, I'll probably move relatively quickly through, and then uh, we can go back into any of the sections and go deeper uh, where basically where everybody, wherever anyone is interested. Um, cool, so what do we mean by machine learning products? Machine learning products are basically products that would not have been possible without the machine learning models at their core. So like machine learning has been kind of uh, enabling products for the last decade at least. Um, you know, it's optimizing the battery on your smartphone, it's determining what photo you'll see next on a social media app. But there would seem to be a big difference in terms of like actual products which are native machine learning or native AI products. Um, I think people can kind of feel that when they started playing around with DALI and ChatGPT from OpenAI this year, and could kind of note that these actually these products felt different. Um, so what we'll be looking at is like what was different about these products, what can we learn from them, and kind of what are the implications for other people who are kind of approaching uh, building these types of things. Um, so I like this quote from this uh, ex CEO of uh, GitHub where he's talked about when he left GitHub a couple of years ago after building Copilot. He left GitHub thinking, no, oh, the AI revolution is here, and basically um, everybody is now going to be building products of this stuff, and it's going to be all over the place. And then he kind of realized that that did not quite develop. Um, so he realized that researchers raced ahead, and they delivered this bounty of new capability to the world. But product people, entrepreneurs, et cetera, have not yet caught up with that. Um, there is a capability overhang that's just hanging out in the world, and entrepreneurs and product people are only now kind of starting to suggest this and ask the question, like, what can you now build that you couldn't build that people actually really want to use? Um, just to give an idea of where people are now looking at this stuff, there's like a, one of these type of landscape things created like every two days, I'd say. Um, but they all touch across the same kind of area. So text, image, audio, video, chatbots, code, 
platform, search, gaming, data, all this type of stuff is now kind of in play or uh, increasingly in play um, in the kind of startup or big tech space. Um, so what type of products are now possible with machine learning? Um, this is the A16Z kind of view, which is pretty accurate, but also pretty dry. It's, you know, mar uh, basically these models now have the potential to disrupt markets which have traditionally been out of reach for software. So there's a lot of capabilities we now have, which we would not have been able to have with just kind of, uh, you know, traditional software. So these are markets which kind of relied on humans to navigate natural language, Im images, physical space, and, and things like this, which are worth kind of huge amounts of, uh, yeah trillions of dollars um and yeah just another example is like the uh, they can their models that can interpret images transcribe speech or generate natural language and can perform uh, other complex tasks um this is accurate and but this doesn't kind of you know doesn't kind of fill you with inspiration or doesn't kind of tell you what's actually possible so um Nat Friedman and Daniel Gross put uh, two kind of uh, angel investors put together this AI grant website, which is pretty good at kind of giving a bit a little bit of more interesting look into the AI native products. So, like, what are these actually going to look like? You know, so much is but nobody's going to know. But there's lots of kind of areas which are worth kind of just paying attention to. So, copilot models, so assistance. There's uh, utility products built on large language models. The fact that latency matters. AI native social networks, generative entertainment, new creative workflows, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as I said, you can have a look into this and kind of see what are uh, some of the more interesting areas. A lot of them are like um, focusing on like what are the constraints of machine learning and, and how do you actually figure out how you can build a product which kind of accounts for all of these kind of various complica complicated things which uh, are relatively new to the kind of the product building space. Um, so, Moving on, um, I'll touch on a couple of reference products which I think are interesting to kind of discuss, and especially when I start looking, diving into some of the key areas, um, I'll be drawing on some of these as examples as again. Um, so obviously, PaperCup, we are a, a, a company. We are like our, our uh, product is not actually accessible to people to use. What we sell, it's kind of B two B to C. So what we have is we ingest like seasons of TV or movies or whatever it might be. And we run it through our multi-stage pipeline. We have a human in the loop who actually uh, kind of reviews everything and makes sure that everything is accurate and is kind of reaches the customer standards. And then we feed it back to the customer. So uh, all of our products is kind of internally facing at the moment. Um, the human in the loop actually is many different humans. Um, we have kind of teams of uh, very skilled translators who are kind of based all around the world, depending on which languages they're uh, working on, um, who actually look at the various kind of stages in the pipeline and review, you know, the pronunciation, review the expressivity and review all sorts of different things. Um, we are a, a company who basically uses a combination of uh, internal um, kind of bespoke machine learning models, which we focus on, which are very are focused around text to speech and primarily around how you can generate expressive speech. So that's one of the most difficult things that we work on. So there's lots of companies that try, try to, you know, make a voice that sounds like Obama speaking French or whatever it might be. But our thing is like, it, it doesn't quite matter as much if you've got the exact persona of the voice right. It's the expressivity, the tonality, the information that gets captured in the speech, which is kind of far more important. So that's where we spend our time um, and efforts kind of researching. Um, and we use plenty of off the shelf stuff as well from, you know, in terms of like, we can't try to do everything. So we just run kind of standard uh, speech recognition and machine translation stuff. And we use the kind of the, the translators that on our team to actually update this and kind of feedback into the system. Um, so that's one kind of approach that uh, we're taking a paper group. There's other projects. So Synthesia is another kind of product which is being built out of uh, London. It is basically a product which allows you to generate videos from text. Um, so they focus quite heavily on avatars and kind of, um, you know, they, they also lean, uh, lean into the idea that, you know, if it's, if you create something in one language, you can then generate it in 10 others by just kind of running it through translation systems. So it's this whole concept of like, what happens now that you can create a video with using just kind of, you know, the text as an input rather than actually having to get some, uh, somebody in a studio and get somebody to edit the video and all this type of stuff. Synthesia, on the other hand, takes a kind of uh, B to C approach, or B, you know, basically, it's like a, a, the, the user interface that they've built is like all 
a web app and also also can be accessed via API. So they have obviously kind of taken a different core machine learning technology in terms of the avatar deepfake technology, uh, kind of identified a different approach in a different market and then uh, basically, but it's another useful uh, way of thinking about it. Like, the various constraints that people have and seeing how uh, different startups will actually approach this. Then we have other kind of examples. So GitHub Copilot is quite well known. It, it was actually built on, I can't remember what the name of the model was, but it was a model from OpenAI. Um, there is a really excellent interview with uh, Nat Friedman on Astro Techery, um, where he's talking about all of the product decisions that went into GitHub Copilot and how they actually, this is the quote I like to just how do you take a model which is actually pretty frequent, which is actually pretty frequently wrong, and still make it useful? Um, and yeah, that, that's a very useful sentence to hold in your mind when you're thinking about machine learning models in general. Um, then we have Midjourney again, another one of the companies who has kind of built out this uh, text to image kind of model during the year. They also did a lot of interesting product work in the fact that they didn't build their own interface. What they did was just piggyback off Discord and kind of built this kind of collaborative um, Discord uh, user interface and just leveraged pretty much everything that it has. I think they have, might have the biggest Discord in the world now. Um, and then finally, you have OpenAI, who I'm sure most people are familiar with, who are building all sorts of everything in terms of uh, every different model, who are kind of looking um, yeah, looking like one of the behemoths that are going to rise out of the kind of the next kind of uh, wave of machine learning startups. Um, so just quick intro so everyone knows what I'm talking about, and then I kind of might reference these as I'm walking through some of the key concepts, which are over here. So um, I'm going to touch on kind of my experience on this, but I'm more than happy to give any um, or answer any questions or anything in terms of how other companies are approaching it. But different types of teams that you might be dealing with when you are actually uh, working in a machine learning or building a machine learning product. You might have a data team, an applied research team, and a core research team. Um, that is relatively self-explanatory. will also obviously depend on what type of kind of data you're working with. But applied research, the easiest way to think about it is these are teams who are actually looking for solutions, or as core research or basic research are looking to build knowledge. Um, so we have both of these within PaperCup. So we have kind of applied research teams who are trying to fix uh, issues relating to speech generation, whereas core research might be looking at like how we can generate a piece of speech which is more listenable in long form or you know some type of uh, piece of knowledge which can be used to generate models off the off the back of it um, so actually making the move from research to production uh, papers and sample results do not always translate to real world impact or anything really um, you will often see uh, kind of papers and results uh, which are produced uh, and people and you know oftentimes it, it's yeah, sometimes people will just kind of cherry pick the very best of what the model is possible of. Um, so yeah, in terms of research, it doesn't always actually make a real world impact when you're building products. Other times, it, plenty of times it will, but it's just that um, when you see uh, you know, a, a, a paper posted online with the data and things like that, it can be quite hard to replicate, replicate this and actually get the real world impact that the authors are kind of, uh, kind of proclaiming. Uh, timelines and certainty. So in comparison to engineering cycles, research cycles are longer. Um, you know, where you, uh, engineering teams might be able to work in two week sprints and might be able to ship many features and many platform additions in that time. Research cycles are significantly longer and uh, but also the certainty is much lower. Um, but on the other hand, industry progress broadly is much faster, especially in the kind of large language model uh, space that we've seen in the last kind of year. So whereas like your, your individual team will probably be working on slower cycles, the actual industry is moving at such a pace that it kind of, yeah, it, it definitely feels it's a kind of strange concept of time when you're working with machine learning. Um, and then again, in terms of certainty, basic research versus targeted research, or as, it's called it, uh, as we call it kind of applied versus core, you generally hope that your applied research team will be able to really reach a solution uh, one way or another um, in a kind of shorter time period and, uh, than your core research team, which is kind of much uh, lower certainty to actually deliver something. 
Um, so your bets need to be targeted when you're actually trying to pick an a, a direction for your core research because you know you're not certain that it's going to pay off so you need to make sure that you're actually the fewer the the less kind of bets you're placing you need to make sure that they will actually be able to make an impact um where your actual models come from so as i said like paper group uses uh expressive tts models that we generate ourselves for which is internal we also use uh, speech recognition and machine translation models from from other people um, which we kind of pay for on a cloud basis so just uh, basically for, yeah just over an api uh, and then we can also just pull off the shelf models off github so if we need an nlp model to kind of highlight some type of information in a piece of text we can just pull that off github and, and run it uh, natively uh, next up, this is kind of a very key one, which uh, relates back to the Nat Friedman quote earlier, which is models fail. How do you make sure that that happens gracefully? Um, failure modes are a very big thing in uh, in uh, machine learning products. You'll see that pretty much everywhere. Um, and it's the big thing is like, how do you make sure that the product is not a failure just because the model fails? A good example of this is DALI. So DALI has, um, it's the text to image, uh, piece of uh, basically model that uh, OpenAI released. If you have a, you know, you give it a piece of text and it generates a picture for you off the base of, back of it, but you know, the face is the, the wrong thing or it doesn't work quite well. They have like in painting and out painting where you can just like remove that and then you can regenerate it again. So you can keep all of the bits that is good and you can actually regenerate the bit that fails. So there's kind of nice product ways that you can uh, account for these failure modes which will allow you to come up with like keep the good bits uh, regenerate the bad bits and hopefully it'll work. Bad, uh, bad approaches to model failure is like tesla full self-driving um you know they claim that it's full self-driving and you're kind of you know people are kicking back putting their feet out the window as they're, they're cruising along but when the failure uh, when the model fails for a full self-driving the impact is uh, kind of literal impact can be quite a lot worse. Um, so failure modes can be very uh, kind of detrimental to the perception of a machine learning product. Um, and it's all about how you can actually handle this gracefully. Um, I actually asked ChatGPT, what are some more interesting facts about um, kind of failure models? There's uh, some other ones I hadn't quite thought of. So ensemble models is basically where you have multiple different models which are running to uh, give you kind of various different results. Um, you can monitor the model, you can have redundancy in it, you can have human oversight and you can have explainability, make, you know, pushing to have your model make it more explainable might allow you to kind of identify potential failure modes and take appropriate action. Um, so thanks to ChatGPT for that. Um, Paper Group's approach and the approach for many companies is by having a human in the loop, um, which basically means you are having a person involved in the oversight of the uh, actual model and the product. This allows the user to change the outcome of an event or process. So for us, it could be, you know, this word was pronounced incorrectly and we just have our translators just correct that and feed it back into the uh, model. Um, this basically allows uh, products to go to market counting for different failure modes. Um, you know, as I said, self-driving ChatGPT. Uh, ChatGPT was an interesting one because um, the underlying model, which it's uh, built on, was you know released well over a year ago, I think. The GPT three, they call it GPT three point five. Um, but it, it, what what OpenAI did was basically run a human in the loop system for a while. I think they had like 30 or 40 people, I could be wrong on that, um, who were involved in asking questions and trialing it out and feeding it back into the system and kind of trying to build up uh, all the edge cases and make sure that they could actually bring a product to market, which was uh, accounting for all of these different failure ones. Um, so you've been in the loop in this concept of like, who is a human and how, where you are, um, where you're going to kind of offload the complexity to is a very key element when you're thinking about actually how to build product uh, machine learning products then there's feedback loops again so in the in like if you're thinking about uh human and loop inputs how these are then feeding back into the system is also quite significant um some will improve the performance of your model over time so you know uh for paper group knowing how these words should be pronounced will probably improve the way our model is able to predict pronunciations over time but then some feedback loops will actively uh, degrade the performance of the machine learning model over time so can contribute to model drift so if we are feeding back in incorrect pronunciations and we don't have a, a tight loop there then you know it can actually lead to those the model getting worse over time. Um, model stability again is a key factor in terms of how well a model generalizes to new unseen data. 
Um, a stable model produces similar results when trained on different training data uh, and when you used to make new predictions on new data. Um, so an example of like model stability uh, as it relates to, to paper group is like the length of the speech or length of sentences which we use to uh, generate the model will kind of will kind of set the the amount or the kind of the, the problem space which we're able to work in. But if we tried to feed our uh, text to speech model a a sentence which is you know three pages long, it it's not been trained on this model. It's not stable at beyond that uh, length, and the, the kind of there will definitely we're all pretty likely to run into failure modes. Uh, it could just be kind of the loss of the expressivity, and it could just go into very monotonous or just kind of the, the, um, various different uh, areas. But model stability again is a key uh, factor to be aware of when you are building machine learning products. Then there is data drift as well. Um, in terms of how the underlying data that the model is trained on changes over time. So if we had trained a text-to-speech model on, uh, you know, 1800s England uh, vernacular, then it the the data drift would have occurred. And if we would were still trying to use this text-to-speech engine now, it wouldn't work so well because you know the way people speak actually changes over time. So the data changes over time. So we need to be able to keep up with that. Um, latency as well is very important. So, like actually figuring out how long it, the inference uh, time takes and figuring out, you know, what it This is a key factor in deciding the product UI. So, GitHub Copilot, as you're typing code, you're thinking about tons of things up very quickly and you need to be aware of like, what's going on. So, GitHub Copilot, uh, or sorry, the model, the OpenAI model, which they ran it on, was. Um, it was smaller than it, the, the largest possible model they could have run because the larger model would have taken more time to actually generate uh, answers back. And that would have kind of resulted in a poor UX for the user. So being aware in terms of how long the inference might take for a, a given model will impact the product decision here. Um, I'm going to keep pushing ahead. So uh, tech stack, it's different. That's all you need to know. Um, costs of multiplying matrices in terms of inference is more computationally expensive than database lookups. So, um, yeah, again, costs for machine learning uh, startups and products is, is definitely going to be higher than for a uh, traditional software. Um, again, there is this whole concept which I really like, which is deflationary AI. So, in terms of my, uh, seeing productivity gains and kind of disruption coming in at the lower end of the market, I think it, it's interesting to think now what is possible if um, all of these jobs are now possible at kind of much cheaper costs. There is obviously, as you've seen, kind of a lot to think about in terms of what are the constraints and how might we be able to handle these. But um, in terms of like dubbing videos of Papercup or creating videos with Synthesia, these are now possible at like a much lower cost than would have been possible in the past. So um, Daniel Gross, I, again, I linked it in the references, has a good article about deflationary AI and what, AI and what might be possible here. Um, and I'll finish up with just a couple of thoughts on kind of the impact to the economics um, and uh, of kind of startups and products. This is an open end question, but like where does margin accrue in the AGI supply chain? So from kind of optical providers who which feed into uh, kind of the ultraviolet lithography all the way down to like application codes like uh, Synthesia and Papercup. Where is margin actually going to accrue in this? Um, who is going to be the winners? And, and you know, how is it all going to shake out here? Um, A16Z focus on like the commercial impact again, lower gross margins due to heavy cloud infrastructure usage and ongoing human support, scaling challenges due to the thorny problem of edge cases, uh, weaker defense modes due to the commoditization of AI models and challenges with data network effects. Um, uh, uh, or A16Z has some more stuff about like taming the tail and the long tail uh, distribution of machine learning. Um, and basically this being a problem that uh, application codes need to solve. Um, because if you don't, it can be equally painful, missed customer opportunity for economics or for strategy users. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last point is on kind of the decentralization of ML. Um, so I remember there was a quote from Peter Thiel a couple of years ago about crypto being libertarian and AI communist, kind of touching on the decentralization or centralization of these kind of technology. Um, many assume that AI would be a centralizing, um, would have a centralizing effect, and only those with the data would benefit, whether that be nation states or big tech companies. Um, but I think that kind of uh, narrative has changed this year with stable diffusions, code, and model weights being released publicly. Um, they're able to run on consumer hardware and mobile that's kind of, it's really pushing others to be a lot more open because it kind of 
the, this technology is now already getting out there. Uh, so it's now becoming increasingly clear that kind of, uh, machine learning pro models and products will be more, de more decentralized than many anticipated. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we're at. So if, we, if this stuff is going to get decentralized, we need to figure out how to build products, how, where to upload the uh, complexity, how to actually kind of account for a different failure model, and then actually make an impact and hopefully uh, gain the kind of benefits of the deflationary AI thesis. Um, and that is where we're at. Uh, I have a link to some, a lot of kind of interesting pieces in here, um, but I'm also happy to take any questions as well. Bearing in mind, I can't see anybody on my move. So, yeah, I think the uh, the probably the most important one, Killian, is we were we were talking about um, AI as centaurs versus butlers in the, in the Discord. Um, so we just want to check that you're not a deep fake video and voice of an AGI yourself. Uh, I can neither confirm nor deny that. <laughs> um, yeah, but, uh, one of the actual uh, serious questions that came up, so uh, from Nathan, um, for Paper Cup, um, are the human corrections uh, fed back into the, the ML model in some way? Um, you know, and how do you generally deal with that? Yeah, they are. So we have, uh, as I said, we have a multi-stage pipeline. So we have uh, transcription, translation, and then speech generation. So we have different types of, or we have different types of data, and we have different types of, uh, yeah, basically corrections that get fed into it. Um, and these get fed back into the system uh, in, in various different ways and in various different uh, kind of uh, mechanisms. So it's not like, um, it's not an automated process where many assume like, you know, it's seen this, it's automatically going to be better at it the next time. Because of this issue that if you feed incorrect data back into, we need to be kind of relatively careful and have certainty that whatever we're feeding back into the system is going to benefit from us or benefit from it. So like, um, sometimes we run secondary processes where we would have people kind of assess the word pronunciation, which uh, goes back into the system to make sure that it is actually going to make things better. Um, and then we might have, um, you know, various different aspects or, or control that gets levered on the expressive speech. So, you know, if we generate a sentence and it applies the emphasis or kind of on, on the wrong word or wrong sentence in a word, um, we basically are able to control the, the, the text and speech models to, to be able to update that. But again, it's it's not an automated process, but it is uh, data that we can then use to feed back into the system, retrain, and then hopefully kind of uh, improve the system over time. Um, any more, uh, any other questions? I'm um, just keeping an eye on the, on the Discord um, as well. Okay, I think we don't have any coming in. Uh, Kelly, I've got, I've got one for you. Um, uh, so you're talking about like, um, you know, the, the whole theme of the talk is productizing ML research. Like what, what's your sense of like common failure mode uh, common failure modes trying to do that like when what common failure modes have you experienced or have you heard about or you know have your research team and your like engineers come to you and kind of been chatting about over um coffee and stuff like are there any common threads it, it really it really differs over um what type of area you're talking about so with those in terms of uh expressive speech generation that is something which uh, our, our team and our models do extremely well so they're able to kind of take the the input sentence understand like what are they what are the key expressive parts in it and then try to uh, kind of generate that in a different language so um but there's a million different ways that you can actually do that so you know uh, if you give an interpreter or if you give 10 interpreters one sentence they'll all interpret it in different ways and be able to kind of communicate it in different ways um so our models we have to actually you know we have to kind of define weights and come up with ways of actually um you know defining what is the best so we can generate a piece of speech which does it quite well or we can generate a piece of speech which does it like you know it, which is more close in terms of the expressivity to it but as you start doing that, the, the failure modes start kicking in because you start pushing the model to the limits of what's actually possible. Um, and then you you get all sorts of weird stuff actually arising from the data. So we might get these like weird breathing sounds or we might get like clicks or we might get just people going like, it's just, 
all manner of kind of strange noises that that may exist in the data set which the voices have been trained on will kind of start to appear um and that as a failure mode is a million miles away from uh you know the types of failure modes which uh you know gpt3 is facing where you know people are tricking into it to like telling it how to uh, give you a nuclear bomb or whatever it might be. Um, so there's like many different failure modes depending on what the, what each type is. So it, it, it very much differs depending on what the model is trying to do. That's uh, got the hand up for a question. So uh, pass it over to Venka. Okay. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my question is, uh, uh, I've had a lot of discussions with other machine learning people on a topic which seems to confuse everybody, which is how does the unit economics of um, inference work in all the different applications? Like if, if you talk to the researchers, you get kind of like a per token uh, cost that you then sort of um, combine with the GPU sort of rental costs and get to like, you know, per token, whether it's pennies or dollars or whatever it is. Uh, it's more natural to think in terms of words, words for the text generation models. Uh, some researchers seems to seem to talk in terms of passes of like full blocks or images or something like that. So the first question is, uh, what is the right unit in which to think of uh, uh, the unit economics of inference, since that's the main way the value is actually delivered? And the other is what are the actual economically viable breakpoints? So like uh, when I first started paying attention, people were talking as though inference of like uh, per word was in the range of like uh, eight to $10. Now I think it's dropped to like uh, sub dollar, like it's per token, but it looks like it'll be a few pennies per word depending on the model you're talking about. But at what point does it become uh, actually viable for both text, um, images, and video. So that's the question. What are the units and when do they become viable? Mm. That's good questions. I I think, it, honestly, I, I think the, the ecosystem has not, uh, especially when you're thinking about large language models, has not reached a level of maturity where people, where we actually know the answers to this very well. Um, people are training larger and larger models uh, on, you know, especially all of the kind of the main research works um and i don't think we're at the level of maturity where where there is a, a great uh, mechanism for this for paper group we have uh we're basically uh generating text speech models is, is comparatively less expensive for inference than than you know large language models so um you know and, and also i think it's probably the best in terms of like text is a like you know words is a very reasonable approach um to to calculating the cost but the costs are low enough for us that this is kind of not something which is really top of mind our unit economics are strong enough because the uh, text generation is a, is a lot lower uh yeah so the actual cost of this is a lot lower but for uh large language models in terms of like the the economics is, is very different obviously um and at what point it becomes viable i honestly have no idea like i i think we're probably too early in this to actually know because like i know based on kind of estimates i've seen of how much uh chat gpt is costing the uh open ai to run at the minute um the i would suspect the vast majority of uh queries that are being fed into it today would not be uh you know viable or people would not actually value them high enough if they had to pay something close to the actual price of what it, what it costs but for uh, OpenAI, they're kind of just eating their cost at the minute because the benefit for them is that they're getting to see all the different ways that people are able to use it. And they're also able to use it as a kind of a lead gen for uh, you know any future uh, API model which they will have and, and be able to operate at scale. So um, I don't have a great answer for you, but I suspect that we will probably know a little bit more, probably not for at least a year, I think, anyway. Um, the reason I started pulling all this together is that there's, there's still so many things that need to shake out in this uh, industry. And in particular, the, the economics of the large language models are, are one. Um, I think Maya's got a question uh, as well. And then we've got uh, one from Osman as well. 
And yeah, so my question is, you, you had an interesting section where you talked about what to do if you have a model that fails and how to keep the application from failing. And I was wondering, what do you do in a situation like in Paper Cup where the question is intonation? So if I have two different options, each one with a different intonation, if I try to average it, I'll get you know no intonation at all. And of course, also when you use something like uh, Chat GPT, if I get two answers, I can't average them. So, so how's that dealt with? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, I heard something. This is a, a brief aside, but I, I, I spoke to somebody who did where did a machine learning competition where their their task was to. Um, generate a or basically to predict the next notes in a like midi notes in a sequence in the style of Handel or Bach or something um, and what they found was that the people who got the statistically uh, correct most of the time or kind of the people who won the actual competition actually had the worst sounding music so like in terms of generating the, the piece of uh, speed or generating the midi tones which have come next you might be statistically uh, correct but the actual output is going to be the worst in terms of like you know the, the viewers or the people who are actually experiencing it um so i think about that quite a bit when we're looking at uh, speech generation which is like you know you, we might be able to predict something um and it might be you know academically the the most uh, accurate piece of speech that has ever been kind of generated in terms of a cross-lingual piece of uh, you know prosody transfer but it might sound like absolute crap to a person who actually understands what it's what's supposed to sound like so um that for us is where the whole human of the loop aspect comes in where you, we need to have people who understand the context context is probably the most important word that i've learned over not that i've learned but that kind of we focused on over the last couple of years which is context is incredibly important a word can be said a million different ways a sentence can be said a million different ways as you said so the question intonation might have two different uh, com two complete different meanings so having somebody who is familiar with the context of the the actual piece of speech is is the most important piece and that will allow them to kind of review and and kind of uh, choose or control whatever the the appropriate version is um sorry i think there was a second piece to the question but i can't quite remember no 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 you you, you answered the question i mean the question was what do you do and if i understood the answer correctly you're saying uh, the best thing to do is to learn better how to choose a correct answer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, we, we might have uh, several models running under the hood um, and we might know, uh, we might be able to predict, okay, this might be the best one given this context. So this model is better at question intonations in general. Um, so we might then, you know, surface that option as, as the default. Our translator might review it and then they might think, actually, no, you know, this is good at very obvious questions, but this is more of a rhetorical question. So in this situation, it doesn't apply as well. So it's actually a, a, a different model, which is uh, kind of better suited and they might listen to that, think, yeah, okay, and then apply that one. So um, understanding the context and then building the UI and the, the UX for the, for the user to actually be able to kind of select the right option is, is kind of the, the best way of approaching it but it, 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 it you know your mileage might vary depending on what type of product you're actually building thank you uh, i think we've got another question from osman which i can uh read out osman or make a noise if you want to uh, if you want to word it yourself otherwise i'll just read out what you're supposed to do okay um, so, uh, Osman asked, can you talk a little bit about how machine learning products are priced um, in the enterprise? Um, he said he's curious how companies deal with unexpected costs uh, for trading and inference, um, and if it makes it challenging to have a stable margin. Um, again, this will this will vary hugely depending on like where who we're actually looking at. So let's pull up, go back to our examples. Um, so for someone like Papercup, in terms of how we handle this type of thing, there generally is, there has not been kind of huge surprises in this type of stuff like our model. We understand the limitations of models and we understand the constraints. So we, we generally don't run into kind of huge issues here. Um, I know Synthesia before they were kind of landed on the model that they did previously, we're looking at kind of quite bespoke work. So, you know, they would uh, work with advertising companies or whatever to to say, okay, give us your give us your advertising of, 
I don't know if this is their actual example or somebody else, but give us a, a Snoop Dogg saying one thing in one language, and then it, he's actually signed a contract, which means this applies to 10 different other geographies. So we're going to uh, train a Snoop Dogg model that will allow him to say the kind of brand offshoot in each of the 10 countries, and we'll distribute this ad without actually having Snoop to get back in the studio to record it again and again. Um, so when you're looking at a kind of a services model like this, I think you are a lot more likely to run into um, you know, uh, issues in terms of margin, especially on kind of one-off project basis or things like that. Um, but I think the, the margin um, for Synthesia or Paper Cup as kind of startups is kind of relatively uh, much more of a known prospect. Um, I would say the, the riskier side for Paper Cup is if like, if we didn't have any mechanism for stopping um, the, the amount of work which went into uh, the human and loop side. So if, if, you know, the amount of work is, is effectively endless, you could, you could tweak and, and do something all day, which would actually uh, kind of, you know, drive down the unit economics. But we, we just have to learn how, what actually makes a video good enough. And then we need to be able to um, kind of build the mechanisms to allow, or to kind of highlight to the users, okay, yeah, we think this is good enough to hit our, our customers uh, um, kind of quality bar. Um, with Synthesia, they would just basically, you know, because it's a user, it's user facing tool where to, uh, people actually need to use it. It's like the inference costs, I imagine, uh, you know, without knowing, without uh, actually knowing inside the company, I, I imagine uh, inference costs are, are not something which have kind of caused them huge amounts of, of issues. Again, like I said, with the kind of mid journey or open AI stuff, um, the field generally is moving on so quickly that, like, there is significant advances in terms of uh, you know the cost that it, uh, the cost that it, uh, the cost of inference for both text to speech and avatar generation i imagine has come down um by orders of magnitude in the last few years so like with the open ai example of in terms of like what is the right unit like these things are changing so quickly that uh, it's um yeah it's hard to keep track but in general the the number is going down for kind of more targeted things like avatar generation or uh, text to speech but the number might be going up if you're an open eye where you're dealing with you know you're increasing the the size of your model by orders of magnitude and then trying to figure out how to kind of create a platform play off the back of that i hope that answered the question Um, Kelly, I've got one for you. So uh, we we're talking about timelines. So um, I think I've seen the the AI grant thing that uh, that you were talking about, and it talks about um, you know how just AI models uh, wrapped around existing processes don't really have a very long shelf life. Like they get irrelevant pretty quick. Uh, I'm not sure whether that would be measured in weeks or months, but you know it's not very long. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got kind of like more. Um, for some reason, the example that comes to mind is like a Coca-Cola, right? Which is like a brand which has been around for decades and be can be like continually milked, so to speak, for, for value. Um, where do you see kind of like productized machine learning sitting on that spectrum? Like how long can a company have a viable moat for before they have to, you know, before they become irrelevant or before they have to like reinvent themselves or, you know? Yeah. Um... I kind of expect to see things shaking out in this way as somewhat of a mirror of um, of the internet, where uh, the internet led to kind of a barbell shape uh, in the market where you have a lot of incredibly large companies who are able to kind of accrue a, a lot of value. Um, and then you also have tons of smaller creators or smaller companies who are kind of more niche focused, who are able to also kind of, you know, uh, carve out a living for themselves, but not necessarily, um, you know, operate at the same scale or anything like this, but kind of really flesh out the long tail there. Um, I would say I will I would kind of expect to see similar kind of thing in um, in kind of machine learning products where you might see people like OpenAI potentially, you know, stable diffusion or mid journey or some other, you know, um, Google as well, I'm sure will probably make a dent in this kind of world. Um, where you'll see kind of a couple of uh, very large players who are able to build these kind of foundation models um, who are, you know, able to be service providers to everyone across the board. Um, and, and will kind of accrue a lot of value. Um, 
And then you'll also see uh, a lot of kind of smaller companies who are kind of picking specific niches who are able to also kind of, you know, win their categories. So for, for in Pipe Group's case, it's like, you know, dubbing videos. I, I think that there's a, kind of the expertise and the understanding of all of this type of stuff is going to, you know, basically lead to, to niche companies uh, being very successful um, and very large companies being very successful. But um, yeah, the, in terms of like, you know, we're building a Photoshop, which now you're able to look up, um, you know, you're able to call Dali from. Like, I don't see, you know, just dropping in these features as being kind of a winning strategy for the kind of the, the middle of the middle in terms of these uh, products. So that's kind of how I expect things to, to shake out. Um, okay, and then I've got one more question. Um, and uh, before we just take a break before the all hands, um, so I, I recently watched, um, uh, a couple Jim Keller talks, um, and he was talking about, uh, this idea that in, in hardware at the moment, at least, um, he kind of thinks that open is going to win. Um, you know, and there's a lot of talk around like risk, risk five or whatever the, however it's pronounced. Um, do you think that kind of like that idea or that kind of, uh, philosophy holds when it comes to machine learning, AI capabilities and software models? Sorry, could you expand on that a little bit? When you said open, you mean like openness and hardware? Uh, like open source. Um, okay. So, um, you know, do, do you see open source as winning in machine learning and AI as it's being prophesy to kind of win in hardware? Mm. That I, I have a lot less of a strong opinion on. Um, I think sh things could shake out in a, in in many different ways. And also like, you know, even if you look at uh, open hardware or anything like this or open source uh, hardware or software, like did open source software win? No, but is it still like the backbone of the internet and the, the foundation for everything, um, you know, that it runs on? Yes. So like, I would say it's very hard to predict how this is actually going to play out. I do think like the most interesting thing in my mind in, uh, in kind of this year has been the release of stable diffusion and the, the kind of proof that these models are able to run kind of at source. So you can run them if, if not on a mobile yet, I'm sure somebody is working on getting it running on like an old iPhone or something. Um, so this, this software will be able to be deployed pretty, pretty much everywhere I suspect. Um, but again, I think before we even get close to, to knowing how this is actually going to play out, there, we we need to cross this chasm in terms of like how do we actually build good products with them? Because like there's still, as I said, there is this huge overhang. So much needs to shake out before I have any kind of insight into into who will win this in a in a more broader sense, in terms of like openness or closeness. Okay, that's really cool. Most of my answers today are just like. Let's let's see. Um, I can I can give you some opinions on how to build uh, nice products, but in terms of how things are going to shape out in the macro sense, it's it's all up for grabs. Okay. Um, well, I think so. Uh, we'll probably like officially call it there um, and take like a. Uh, I think we'll take a, t a 10, 20 minute break and reconvene. Um, but if anyone wants to stick around, um, you know, questions, discussion, etc. Feel free to do so. Um, I'll chuck up a, I'll chuck up a timer on the screen as well. If you need two seconds.